Give me the signal. Well, there it is. Okay. Uh, good morning, afternoon, evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm George Moss again here at allpointstv.com. And also, we want to welcome uh, WFOV 92.1. And we are so glad to have you with us this afternoon on a Monday. And uh, we are coming to you with some very tragic news in the sports world. I guess you've heard about Kobe Bryant. And uh, we want to give our condolences to his family. Everybody's talking about his basketball career and how great he was on the basketball court. What I liked about Kobe was that after he had gone through that one trauma that he had uh, with, with his family, I think his, I think and his wife had gotten a divorce, I think, John. I think they had gotten a divorce to get back together again. And um, once they reunited the family, you have to give him credit for what's really important. That was he was a very good family man, he had four daughters, and it's tragic that one of the daughters perished with uh, eight other people, I think it was nine person on that helicopter. And uh, I don't know if it went down by one of the blades hitting the side of the mountain or something. They said it was in one of the valleys. But um, I don't know if you want to fly in that kind of uh, weather that says a lot of mist out there. Sad news to hear that a person that has so much going for him and somebody had made a transition pretty well from the basketball court and went on and to transition into the second part of his life where he was actually doing a lot of things in business. And Kobe was multi-talented. I understand he had three languages that he spoke. Uh, this is a kid that came out of high school, finished, I think, high school at 17, and went into the NBA Jerry West was saying uh, on one of the programs, the great Jerry West was saying that he had to drive Kobe to practice because Kobe was too young to drive. He was only 17 years old when he went to the NBA. Great player, but I will re remember him and how he was with his daughters. I was just re really impressed with the um, role model that he was for a lot of people who do not understand the responsibilities they have when they bring children into the world. And by the time the child was born, they're gone somewhere else and wandered off into the sunset. Kobe was one of those persons that stayed involved with his children. And I know they're going to really miss their father, and a lot of persons are going to miss him as a family member and friend. And it's sad to hear the uh, news. Okay, um, we are going to spend this time talking about the other phase of the impeachment process. And I want, to, I want to talk to you about uh, what is happening right now. I don't know if you saw the first phase of the defense that was put on by the, by the great and brilliant attorneys that are going to give the other side of the coin for the Trump impeachment. And I thought if you, I thought if, if um, you watch the um, prosecutorial part the impeachment process. I think you probably were uh, stunned. <laughs> you probably stunned as I was that they would bring that case to bear upon the American people. They didn't really have a have a, have a strong case. But in that two hours that the defense used last uh, Saturday, I think that they have already dismantled the case. Uh, they just they were so organized and they had so um, much information that was not included in the um, prosecution part of the case by Schiff and by uh, Gerald uh, Nadler, what they did was fill in the parts they left out. And what they left out was all of the things that were sculptory of what they were trying to prove that Donald Trump had done. All the things that would show he had not done those things, they left that part out. <clears throat> For example, the part by Sondland, the, the person that uh, I think was trying to set Donald Trump up, he went and asked Donald Trump, uh, acting like he was innocently trying to find out what the president wanted him to do. But his testimony was he had asked Donald Trump, well, what do you want from um, the Ukrainian uh, government? And Donald Trump said, I don't want quid pro quo, and I don't want him to think, I just want them to do the right thing. And they left that part out, but when you saw the context in which uh, Donald Trump was acting. You can see here, Donald Trump was concerned about one thing, and that is they had pulled out all the speakers trying to undermine his campaign in 2016, 
And before you began to give uh, aid to a government that was criminally involved in trying to stop your administration, when you want to find out if that act is still in, in vogue and, and, and before you, in fact, commit your administration to giving aid to a government that tried to defeat you before you were elected, never thought you'd be uh, elected, and now that you're in the, in the corridors of power, you're in the White House, and you're willing power from those laws, when you want to find out if the aid is going to be continued, it's going to be used against you now that you're the president. And that was what Donald Trump was saying, and that's what they had left out. But when they put it into context, I'm talking about Trump's attorney, it was very clear. Donald Trump was, was trying to find out are they going to continue? Is that government that was doing the things they were doing before he became president, is that government apparatus still in place because what it is, why would he want to then finance a government that's still working against his administration after the fact he's been elected? And so uh, that's what that was about. The thing that gets me, though, is that we have, I, I read the transcript of the conversation between President Donald Trump and President Zelensky. And I, what, what, what is amazing to me is in the aftermath of the transcript coming out, which I don't think Schiff ever thought they would uh, release the transcript because you don't really want to have private conversations that are national security. Uh, th these are these are things that have to do with, with national security. You don't want to have conversations going out when you're talking to another head of state. But in in the case that was coming up, it was either you let. Schiff and Gerald Nadler and the Democratic Party and all the enemies of media uh, tried to act as if there was collusion going on. The president was saying quid pro quo. I think the president had to, had to release it and put out there in the public what the transcript actually showed was the nature of the conversation between him and the president of Ukraine. And that conversation, quite frankly, was very, it wasn't, it, no conversation is perfect. But one thing that's very clear in that conversation, if you listen to it, uh, it, I think it's about what about uh, 30 minutes long. If you listen to that conversation, or if you read the transcript, which you can read the transcript in about five minutes, you can see here that Donald Trump was very focused upon trying to make sure that the Ukraine government wasn't being victimized by the corrupt administration that was in place before Zelensky became president. And also, he was, he was very much about wanting not to have the same uh, apparatus, government apparatus in place, so it in fear, interfere with what he wanted to be uh, about during the next uh, so many years that he has before he runs for election. Because if he's giving aid to, to Ukraine and they still are corrupt, why would he want to participate in that? And so he was trying to, to, to he was saying to Zelensky, I think we've both been through a lot, meaning both countries have been through a lot. And he wanted Zelensky to use his office to look into the corruption on that side because it's a lot more than Hunter Biden. It's amazing what we found out in, the, uh, in this impeachment and also in the aftermath of the election of Donald Trump, which they did not think that would happen. And a lot of them were letting their hair down and talking um, from behind their masks and creating a record they, they never thought would be exposed. But a lot of things have come out here about what really goes on behind the American people's back and how they are, in fact, wielding foreign aid and why they are so much in giving foreign aid to these, uh, the, to these countries around the world. You see, the question that we should have that we should that we should have been asking was how are all these politicians in Congress becoming millionaires? How how are these persons, uh, fifty percent of them, they are they're fifty fifty percent of the people in Congress who don't go in there as millionaires become millionaires after they serve so many years in the in the government of the United States? How are they doing that? And we couldn't figure it out. But now we know how they're doing it. Because it was not just Hunter Biden that was involved in that. You know, in fact, uh, what was going on with Hunter Biden is that 
you give the government the aid, they can't give you anything and put it in your hands. They can give it to your children or to some other influence that you have, and they do it They do it that way. Or you can set up a foundation like the Clintons did, and they finance the, the foundation, and it goes into a kitty on your behalf in, in an indirect way. It's not, it's not paid directly, so it's not a direct violation, but it certainly is a violation of the spirit of the, uh, of the law uh, that, that's been set up. So the way they get around it is that there's no quid pro quo directly paid to uh, the party. It's paid indirectly, as it was in Hunter Biden's case, where they're paying it to, to him on behalf of his father. Because there's no way in the world Hunter Biden is working uh, um, based upon his skill level inside of the group called Burisma, uh, one of the most corrupt corporations I understand in, in, in Ukraine. So that's the way it works, and now I can see how those guys are becoming so wealthy in, in, in Washington, is that they give foreign aid, and then the foreign aid has in it certain particulars and stipulations built into it, so there's a kickback to the politicians, and they get the money on the side, and in, 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 they, they empower their family members and that's how so much of that money now is going back into the coffers of these politicians either directly through their foundation they set up or through some other cons consummate interest that they set up on the side so that the foreign aid, really the taxpayers money is really going in the pockets of the politicians indirectly I couldn't figure out how they were doing it, but now it's it is come out. And if you watch these these um, we're gonna be watching Romney. Because Romney's name has come up in 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 some of his family members are involved in these kickbacks in in Ukraine. And so we'll be watching what happens uh with, with Romney and some of those others in the Republican Party because they are also part of the deal making this going on also. There's going to be a lot of things coming out if the if, if Durham does his job. I'm not sure he's going to do his job. It's taking him a long time to uh, put out his report. But if Durham is doing his job, we should have persons going to jail in on both sides of the political aisle. It's just not. It's not just the Democrats. That's why. That's why they didn't want Donald Trump in there because Donald Trump comes from the outside. And this is a club in Washington. The Democrats are part of the club, and the Republicans are part of the club. And Donald Trump comes in, running in the Republican Party, but Donald Trump is not really a part of the club that's in Washington. And he comes from the outside without the baggage that you have when you come through the system. He didn't come through the system. He came from the outside into the White House. You know what you know what scares me? Is how vehemently they came after Trump. And he's got lots and lots of money at his disposal for a, you know, let's face it, Dershowitz and these guys, they're not going to come cheap, okay? You and I were to come, say we did, you know, Mr. Smith goes to Washington kind of scenario. Mm -hmm. You realize how quickly we'd be shut off, probably executed over anything we said or did because they do not want a challenge to their power base. This should be, That's any, what's I don't care if you like Donald Trump or not, this is a war, clear shot warning of, over every bow of every American, what they were willing to do to anybody who opposes their their plans for us. And that's that's the chilling part. And people, ah, oh, Donald Trump's in Indiana. Guess what? If you were the person to get in power and you finally finally got an office, it could be even a smaller office. They're going to come after you full force. John, that's the bottom line. You know, we can we can say what we we say about Donald Trump, like him or don't like him, that becomes immaterial. What Donald Trump's outside status has allowed us to do is have a window into how government actually operates outside of the eyesight and earshot of the American people, and we're now seeing the true spirit of our government in the United States. We saw that we don't really have in this country government of, by, and for the people. That may be the theoreticals in place, but the practicalities that are in place is that we do not have that. We have a ruling class, an aristocratic group in this country that's running everything from behind the scenes. And Donald Trump came in riding on the wave of dissatisfaction among the American people, rode into the power center in Washington against the interests of the ruling class, 
And they began, it's amazing how early they started this process because what you see now being uh, reported, they started the idea of impeaching Donald Trump when they saw the possibility of him winning even as early as June, you know, he announced it June the 15th when he came down the escalator to announce his bid, they were not taking any chances even at that point because they knew he had the money to finance a strong campaign and they recognized the danger that he had because he was pretty popular, you know, in this program, The Apprentice. And so he had a, he had a, he had a personal, you know, image out there uh, as it was. And everybody recognizes his, uh, his charisma. So he knew that, it, that they knew potentially that he, could, he could be a threat. And then, and they were talking about uh, the possibility of impeachment of Donald Trump in June of 2016, which is very interesting because we haven't even had the nomination yet. They were already putting those plans in place. The what ifs were in place. And you also see that in the conversation they had inside of the FBI between Lisa Page and Peter Stroff. They're in the, they're in the FBI discussing this possibility. And they were asking each other, these two lovers inside the FBI, they were asking, what if he, in fact, does get the nomination? And Lisa Page asked Peter Stroff, what happens in that case there? And he first of all says, well, we're gonna stop him. We are gonna stop him. They're trying to act like they're saying the American people are gonna stop him. They're not talking about the voting. They were not talking about they're going to stop him at the poll. They were saying they're going to stop him by them putting certain impediments in place so that he would not, in fact, be able to do anything even if the American people endorsed him. In other words, they were talking about the fascist mindset that is in place inside of the cores of power in this country, and they were talking as a cabal, a power cabal inside of the network behind the scenes, that they were going to put the monkey ranch in the, in the operation and they were singly going to stop this man regardless as to what the American people had to say about it. But 63 million people went to the polls and voted otherwise. And they were not intending to have that take place, but in case it did take place, they had certain backup plans in place. In fact, the short, the short, the short circuit, if in fact that indeed prevail at the um, day of the election, November the 8th, 2016. They had backup plans for that, and they talked about it out in the open because they still weren't convinced that Donald Trump was going to actually win, but they did say if it does happen, then they had these other plans in place. And those other plans in place are what you're seeing right now, the impeachment of Donald Trump. And somebody said, one of the reports was that 19 minutes after the election was over on November the 8th, 2016, they said that they were now in a smoke-filled room, back rooms, coming together around how they're going to sell the impeachment to the American people to do to Donald Trump what they did now, we can see very clearly, they did to Richard Nixon. It's, it's been documented about Nixon, by the way, how, how they um, ferreted um, a situation in, conjured up a situation where they ferried him out of power. It was, uh, it, it was, it's the same thing we have with the, with the whistleblower. I don't want, I don't want to see, quite frankly, the, um, uh, the trial extended to bring in outside witnesses. But if it does happen, and I think, I don't think it should, and I think it's unconstitutional in order for it to, to, uh, to be done, but, but if, it, if it does come about, one of the things we ought to want to uh, hear is from this whistleblower, who is in fact not a whistleblower, he's a person working for the CIA. And we need to bring him forward to see who he is, what position he has inside of the CIA, and how close he was to those persons inside of the government, such as Lisa Page and Peter Stroff, that were in the FBI talking about the insurance policy, the insurance policy being the impeachment process, and if this person is a whistleblower, is in fact privy to those conversations, and is there, a, is there a collusion, we know there's collusion going on, but is there a collusion that's, that's taking place, really collusion between the FBI and the CIA, and is 
Peter Straub and Lisa Page and this and this whistleblower, uh, they in fact in consort in consort with each other. That's something that needs to be answered. But at the same time, there are some other issues involved in it too. And I, and I don't think, quite frankly, that you can. I, I, I don't. I'm saying I don't think. I know that you cannot constitutionally open the uh, trial up to witnesses that were not called, that were part of the reason why the impeachment verdict was in fact rendered in the House of Representatives. You cannot then open the case back up in the Senate to do the House's work. And I'll tell you why that cannot happen. Constitutionally, it cannot happen. And it cannot happen because you cannot have the, the Senate doing the job that's assigned to the House of Representatives. That's why the Constitution says in Article 1, Section 2, Clause 5, it says the House shall have the sole power of impeachment. Then the Senate, still part of the Congress, but the Senate shall have the sole power to try the impeachment. Meaning the House cannot do the Senate's job and the Senate cannot do the House's job. And I, you get a, I get a little tired, I get a little tired of them saying that they're going to um, do what they did in 1998, 1999, when Bill Clinton was the one on trial for impeachment, and they're going to follow the formula that's found there. Now, that may sound reasonable to a lot of, a lot of people, but I'll tell you what's wrong with that. What's wrong with that particular picture is that that's not the standard. The standard is not what you did in, in another case where you got it wrong in that case. The standard is what the Constitution requires. And the Constitution requires that the impeachment verdict be rendered in the House of Representatives in Article 1, Section 2, Clause 5. And then after the impeachment verdict has been rendered, based on whatever political protocol you put in place in the House, it doesn't have to be uh, treason, bribery, or the high crimes, misdemeanors, as, as some of the, the, the scholars are saying. That's not true. It can be. It, it doesn't really have a standard for the impeachment. That's what that's what the scholars are not getting. It doesn't require. There's no. Here's a here's a the deal. There is no such thing as an impeachable offense. I keep arguing this point. And I can't get anybody to go along with me on this because they think that you have to have treason, bribery, and other high crimes and misdemeanors in order to bring about impeachment. That's not true. And the Constitution does not require that. You can impeach based upon any set of circumstances that more than one half of the members of the House come together on to bring about the impeachment charge. However, if you try to remove the president through the impeachment process, then that standard for that particular aspect of impeachment, not the impeachment itself, but to use the impeachment process, that's what Alan Dershowitz is not getting. It's not the impeachment process. It's a use of the process, which is a distinct aspect of it. In other words, if you have an impeachment, and you're going to use the impeachment for removal, then the standard must be treason, bribery, and other high crimes and misdemeanors for the removal of the, of the office holder. But for the impeachment, you don't need to have that as a standard. And I can tell you that's true because I read carefully, as Dirch, which claims he's read carefully, um, Federalist Paper 65, which is two of the first papers written by Alexander Hamilton. Really, Hamilton's only, only, the only one that wrote about impeachment in the Federalist Papers. I mean, it's mentioned in, in some of the other Federalist Papers, but Hamilton is the only one in there that wrote specifically about impeachment, and he did so in Federalist Papers 65 and 66. 69 mentions impeachment. It's not written... 69 is not written for impeachment, but it does mention it in the sixth paragraph of uh, 
found this paper six six and nine, but it mentions in passing because what it really is about is they're making uh, what Hamilton is doing there is making a distinction between the presidential office and that of King George the Third, and trying to show that the presidency does not lend itself to having the power. Uh, being wielded in that office as it was being wielded by George III because they still have some fear about the central power being too strong. So they're try so he's trying to explain that it would not be that, and that's what he does in 69. But he also talks about, in, in passing, he does mention impeachment in the sixth paragraph of Fairless Paper 69, but that's not the purpose of it. 65 and 66 deal specifically with impeachment. And Hamilton is very clear about of what the requirements are to bring that particular process about. Okay, we, we're just told that um, WFOV, that you're taking a break right now, so we're gonna see you in four minutes, and hope you'll come back after the, your break is over, and we won't be very far away from where we, where we were when you left, so we'll see you on the other side of the break. Uh, you don't have, another, another part of the impeachment process that everybody's missing, you don't really have to remove a federal civil office holder just because that office holder has been impeached. For example, the president has been impeached, and he has been impeached when they took a vote in the House. He was impeached when he had a majority of the, uh, of the members in the House vote articles of impeachment. He was impeached at that point when that vote was in fact taken, and they impeached him on two different charges. One is obstruction of Congress, and they're saying, well, it's not an impeachable offense. It is an impeachable offense. They had a, they had a majority to vote on it. And they also impeached him for abuse of power. And they say, well, that's not an impeachable offense. It is an impeachable offense. But it does not rise up to an offense that, that you can use the impeachment process for the removal of the president. It's a different standard. And I'm, I'm arguing with uh, scholars on, the, uh, on Facebook and other, other networks because the claim that they make, and, and Dershowitz does this, he's on TV a lot making this claim, but Dershowitz is, is making the wrong argument. Uh, Dershowitz is trying to say that the language found in Article 2, Section 4, which says the president, the vice president, and all civil officers of the United States shall remove from power, or says remove from office, upon, it doesn't say upon, it says on. I mean, let me quote it exactly. The president, vice president, and all civil officers of the United States shall be removed from office on impeachment for and conviction of treason, bribery, and other high crimes and misdemeanors, which Dirch was just right in saying other high crimes misdemeanors, meaning crimes like the other two specifically mentioned crimes, treason, bribery, crimes along that, that line. And of course, uh, obstruction of Congress does not meet that test. But that's the removal test it does not meet. Does it meet the impeachment test? Let me say this, there is no impeachment test. The whole idea of an impeachable offense is a misrepresentation of the, of, the, of the impeachment process. There is no impeachment offense. It's a removal offense that's specifically itemized in the Constitution. But you can impeach the president for what they impeached him on. You can impeach, him what, you can impeach the president on what they did for, uh, uh, in the case of the first president that was impeached, did not remove from office, but was impeached. And that was uh, Andrew Johnson, who was impeached in 1868. I don't think they could have removed Johnson, based upon, if, even if they, it fell, it fell by one vote. But what they did to Johnson 
was unconstitutional. The claim they made in that case there was since the Constitution requires, uh, okay, then WFV is coming back. Okay, I'm glad you came back. And as I said and promised, that we would not be very far away from where we were when you left. We are right there in the same area. And we are just kind of finishing up what we were saying about, about how this process works. Uh, what they did in Andrew Johnson's case, the 17th President of the United States, who took the place of Abraham Lincoln after Lincoln had been assassinated uh, on uh, April 14th, 1865, Johnson, the Vice President of Tennessee, became President of the United States. And because he was in a political argument with his own party, although Johnson was not really a member of the Republican Party, he had inherited the presidency from the Republican President Abraham Lincoln, but really Johnson was a, was a Democrat who was not, and you probably remember, he was not on, John, he was not on Lincoln's ticket in uh, 1860 when, uh, when, when, uh, uh, when, when Abraham Lincoln ran for president the first time, he was not, he was not on the ticket. That, uh, the, word, the person who was the vice president was Abraham Hannibal. But when the war breaks out, then to try to balance the ticket what Lincoln did is that he went and chose a person from the South trying to placate the, the South, seven states in which it already succeeded, uh, by the time of his um, uh, his first inauguration, and then four of the states go out in the aftermath of his, his inauguration. So the 11 states outside of the Union, and Johnson's trying to placate them in his re-visiting um, of the of the of his um, the nomination for the second term. So he puts this the Southerner on his ticket from the Democratic Party in the South, from Tennessee, and brought him in there trying to placate the South and bring them back into the Union. So when Lincoln dies, here's this Democrat now is a president. And they are now, combat. There's, com, there's, a, there's a combat going on between the Democrat president taking the place of the Republican president who had been moderate, and now you got Johnson in a war with the Republican Party. And they filed charges of impeachment against him because they were at war with how the Reconstruction would, would, would take place. And of course, the, 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 the members of the Congress felt they should be in control of it. And there's some language in the Constitution that would lend itself to that argument. And there's also the argument can be made that that's also power that's, a, that's arrayed in Article 2 of the Constitution so that process should be in the hands of the president. Both parties can argue that point. But when Johnson would not yield, then they decided then that they were going to remove Johnson from office and they put certain impediments in place so we fall into the trap they set for him. And one of the traps was this person in his, in his cabinet named Edward Stanton, who was the radical Republican side of Johnson administration. They made the claim and I wish it, I would like to have, you know, as a person that studies the Constitution, I would like, I wish it had played out just so we could have an answer to the question that would, would be on the other side of the impeachment process. And that question is, if in fact you remove a president and you make the claim that it was a high crime or a misdemeanor in the same uh, ballpark is bribery or treason and you make the argument that what Johnson did rise to that level what happens if in fact the president denies that that uh, level has been reached through the impeachment process and whether or not that in fact rises to the constitutional standard that's set in article 2 section 4 that would have been a very interesting case because what the radicals did in that case is they argued that if they are beholden by the Constitution to then um, uh, to, to vote to install the nominees of the president, because all the nominees of the president, all, by the way, all the, all the 
uh, federal office holders either uh, in the executive uh, branch, that is the president and vice president, or all of them are appointed by the president. That's why they have Article 2, Section 4 in uh, uh, Article 2, because that's not what the impeachment process is found. The impeachment process is found in Article 1. But the reason why you have Article 2, Section 4 saying the president, vice president, and all civil officers of the United States shall, remove, shall be removed from, from, from office on impeachment for and conviction of treason, bribing, other high crimes and misdemeanors, that's in Article 2, because it's in Article 2 where the president makes the appointment of all of the federal civil office holders, or he and the vice president are in those offices themselves, because they also are federal civil office holders. But the president is involved in all fe federal civil office holders, and that's why they place that aspect of it, because the president, because the president, um, the department of the president, the executive branch of government, is set up by Article Two, and therefore that aspect of impeachment is placed in that part of the Constitution, not as part of the impeachment process, but the use of it for the removal of a civil office holder, which the president has the authority to, in fact, confirm in office by his Article II powers. Because the president nominates all the federal judges, they are subject to impeachment, but the president and his Article II powers brings about their placement in the civil office that, that the president holds. See, that, that's, what, that's what I think that many of the scholars are missing, is how seamless, it, it's just so impressive to go and, and look at the layers of the Constitution and how one part falls into the other part. I mean, this thing is well thought out. That three months that they spent in that room, they were thinking about how what they had said in putting Article 1 to bed, how then does Article 2 read so it does not contradict what's in part, part 1? And it does not contradict. Every part lays into the other part. If you go back and see, okay, Article 2, Section 4, how does that fit in with Article 1, Section 2, Clause clause 5? Or how does it fit in with Article 1, Section 3, Clause 6? It fits in very well with it. Because each part of the government is given its corridor of power beyond which the other corridors of power cannot step into that gap there. The Supreme Court cannot come into the um, area of the House and Senate because they have, a, they have a different responsibility. And the power is separated between the Supreme Court and the Congress because the Congress is taking care of a political matter and the Supreme Court is a legal body and it cannot get into political affairs. That's not, so I, I, was saying the other, I was saying last time also that that's why Roberts is not sitting there as an arbiter in the Senate as that trial goes forward. He's not there to, uh, as an arbiter in the affairs of the Senate. Doesn't it say in Article 1, Section 3, Clause 6 that the Senate should have the sole power to try the impeachment? He can't get involved in that, and that's not why he's sitting there. Roberts is sitting there because in Article 1, Section 3, Clause 6, it says the Senate shall have the sole power of impeachment, but because the president is a civil office holder of the United States, he can be impeached. And when he's the person who's on trial in the Senate, then the person who normally sits there, the vice president, cannot is not allowed constitutionally to sit there when the president is on trial because when the president is on trial, the vice president assumes office if he's removed or if he's not removed, he sits there with a vested interest in the outcome of the trial because the, the because the vice president is the president of the Senate. When so that so Article One, Section Three, Clause Six says when the president is the one on trial, then the vice president is moved to the side, moved out of the Senate in his role as the president of the Senate. The Supreme Court comes in, not the Supreme Court itself. The Supreme Court Chief Justice comes in as the presiding officer. And you'll notice here, as he's sitting there, he doesn't say a word. The only time he'll talk in this trial is when 
when they get past the two sides making their argument, and I don't think that from what I saw this past Saturday that Donald Trump's lawyers will need any 24 hours, each side given 24 hours to give the arguments, and then another 14 hours in which the senators are able to ask questions of the two sides, and they have 14 hours allotted for that. I don't think that Donald Trump's de defense will have to take that much time because they dismantle a lot of that case just in their summary and their outline of where they're going to carry, carry this trial. But if you notice it, before the trial got underway, uh, Roberts, Judge Roberts, made a couple of preliminary comments about how each side should be aware of the fact that they are this body that's seen around the world as having this particular prestige. And the eyes are on you and the quorum should blah, blah, all of those things. But after that was over, you notice how he sat there quiet in their corridor. Why? Because it says the sole power of, in, of the trial of impeachment is not in the hands of the Supreme Court. It's not in the hands of the judge. It's in the hands of the, of the senators. And so you won't see Roberts playing any role while the trial is going on. He can't. Because, see, Roberts is a legal authority. Article 2 sets up a political body that is say it is elected by, by, by the American people. You don't elect the judges. You don't elect the, the, the members on the, on the Supreme Court. The members of the Supreme Court are appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate. The idea of that would, would have been, if they had not changed it, it would have been that the senators as representatives of the states would then confirm the members of the court and other federal civil office holders because they're speaking in behalf of the states, which the people in 1913 changed in the 17th Amendment because they did not understand how important that was to keep that in place because the idea, you cannot defeat these framers now and what they had put in place. They thought this thing through. They were sitting there to confirm the civil office holders. Why? Because they have, the states have a vested interest in who those civil office holders are in those offices on the federal level. Why? Because the states have a vested interest in how the federal government carries out its business because it's carrying the business out in the name of the states of which the federal government is a subsidiary of the states. The federal government is created by the states. And then these guys, all men at this time, no women were in the Congress at that point, although they had one woman that had been in the Congress. No, all, all, I'm not saying men shouldn't be in the Congress or women shouldn't be. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that the Congress at that time, these men in that court of power proposed to change the way we choose senators in this country, and they did not understand what they did in that room, otherwise they would not have changed it. And they allowed for the popular election of the senators, which is a humongous mistake. And I'll, I'll tell you this too. I heard Elizabeth Warren this past uh, week arguing that we should in fact get rid of the Electoral College. This woman said that if she's elected president, now she doesn't understand the Constitution uh, her, herself, she said if she becomes president, she will in fact be the last president that will be elected by the Electoral College. Do you know how crazy you have to be to say, say some, something like that? And why does she say it? Because she doesn't understand how this is how bad these people are in 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 in, in our Congress. Are you are you dissing uh, Pocahontas? Or, I'm, uh, I'm, dis I'm, dis I'm dissing whatever. her, John. I'm dissing her because she is so, uh, and and they don't understand the Constitution in the Congress. They're they're not they're not. I don't want to say they're none, but it's almost down to the level of zero. 
They don't understand the Constitution. She thinks that if she becomes president, she can, through the office of the presidency, can magically invoke some executive uh, prerogative and will the Electoral College out of existence because the executive branch of government will, um, uh, will, will, will not want to have it continued and she can single-handedly stop it from continuing to exist. How will that happen? If she, how, what is she saying that it would end if she's elected president? She's saying she has the power to, if she becomes president to end it. And she does not have that power. The Constitution has to be, has, has to be amended. And it would be a very big mistake if they amended it and then took out the uh, Electoral College. Very, that's a very dangerous proposition. And if she understood the gravity of it and how um, fascist her proposal is, I don't, even as bad as she is, and, and, and much as she is dangerous to the rule of law in this country with, her, with the lies she's telling, I, I don't think if she understood the gravity of what she's, what she's saying, would she uh, be out there at least in public doing that? Maybe behind, the clo behind closed doors she might be, be working behind the scenes bringing bring it about through two-thirds of the House, two-thirds of the Senate proposing it, but you do, and then placing it before the states in order to ratify it. Did you see the meme on Facebook where there's, it's actually probably a connection to an article that says the Electoral College is inherently racist, which I think is like anybody who knows wow. why we have the Electoral College for can see just directly the opposite of that charge. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's probably a subject for another show. But yeah. I, mean, I John, think that's they just don't bizarre that they're coming the, up with that. The, the frame, that, I don't think we should mess with the document put in place by the framers. We messed with it in two major ways already, and we pretty much suspended the original intent of the document because the original intent of the document would not have allowed for the 16th Amendment, which is the income tax, and then to then shake the foundation of the structure put in place by the framers by, in fact, having the uh, document changed so that you choose the senators in the same way that you choose members of the House. That wasn't intended by, by the framers. Framers wanted to have the body that would, would return on a regular basis to the people. They made that body answerable to the people by having it serve for two years. But the ones that were serving the ends of the state, they was placed there by the state legislatures who could recall them if they in fact were not doing the bidding of the state, they would serve six years because they were the representatives of the states themselves. And since the states had created the federal government, they are there as the watchdogs in the federal government of the states. But then it changed that, it, it changed a very fundamental aspect of the constitution and we have not yet understood the price we're paying for that even today. Because what it did, for all practical purposes, is it made every one of the states a province of the federal government. When before that, the federal government was beholden to the states that could, in fact, rescind this verdict. Can't do it now because it no longer speaks for the states. It speaks the same way as a house speaks. And it's elected the same way the house, house is elected. And that was not intended by the framers. We changed it. It was a fundamental change in the document. And then we have people that Pocahontas is saying, Elizabeth Warren is saying that she will change, if she is elected president, she will change the way we choose the president of the United States because they think a single majority vote should choose the president of the United States. They don't know how, they don't know how dangerous that is. And, they, and a, lot of, a lot of people are arguing this now. They're arguing uh, that it'll be, it'll be a, it's undemocratic to have the election of the president through the Electoral College. That's also wrong. That's not right. The, I, I've had people uh, on my post that write on Facebook and say that you're advocating a system that is anti-democratic. It's not anti-democratic. 
a single majority is anti-democratic because what, what that does, it denies any voice, any voice to be heard of the minority group if the majority carries the day in the election president and they maintain that, that majority once he's in power and he does that majority uh, will, why should he, the, the person installed by that majority have to listen to anyone in the minority group? And when I say minority group, I'm talking about racial minorities, gender minorities. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about minorities in terms of factions in the country that are discussed in Federalist Paper 10, where the discussion that was opened up in 9, written by Alexander Hamilton, but Federalist Paper 10, which is the first Federalist Paper, Federalist Paper that was in fact written by James Madison, he picks up the discussion started by Alexander Hamilton in 9, and in 10, he carries it forward, and they were, and they were trying to put, put to bed how to deal with factions, and what they came up with was a, that was a very brilliant plan of how to deal with factions, the most dangerous of which is the majority faction, how do you deal with a faction without, in fact, suppressing it and telling it it has no right to exist? And what they came up with, in terms of how you choose a president, they came up with the Electoral College. And what does that deal with? It deals with multiple factions. Not just one majority, but 50 majorities. That's why I say there's not just Democratic. Democracy is, is, is a danger. What they did to fight the danger of a single majority is that they created 50 majorities. Each state's majority has to be considered in the Electoral College. There are 50 majorities that have to be taken into account. And you cannot come up with anything more brilliant than that. And they changed it in 1913 because they didn't understand it. And Pocahontas doesn't understand what she's advocating. In fact, you know, if you listen to these people in, 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 uh, in, in Congress, you really don't want to give them any power. You want, you want to restrain them just like the, the Articles 1, 2, and 3 was intended to do because when you listen to them, you can see the danger they pose because they don't understand the, the impediments put in place for the power that they choose to will and would will if they had their way about it. Because what they're saying in, in there right now, some of them actually believe this, some of those members of Congress believe that if Donald Trump is impeached and convicted in the Senate based upon the impeachment charge, they think they can haul him off based upon the impeachment and conviction in the Senate if that would happen. It's not going to happen. But if it did happen, they think then they can take him out of the Congress at that point and haul him into jail based upon the conviction of the impeachment charge. They actually believe that. They've actually said that. And that's not true either. But it shows you the mindset that these people are in, that have in the cards of power. Don't forget the impeachment process is a political process. It's not a legal process. That's why they can say the president, vice president, and all civil officers of the United States shall be removed. They say they shall be put in jail for the charge. In fact, there are no legal consequences uh, of impeachment. The president doesn't go to jail. The vice president, if he's impeached, he doesn't go to jail. Or other civil officers, they don't go to jail if they are impeached. They are removed, at the, at, the, at the most, they are removed from office. And then there has to be another vote if they are, in fact, uh, not to hold any additional office. Because if they impeach Donald Trump, let's say, and then they remove him, and then they don't take a vote to uh, forbid him from holding other office, if he's not served a, a second term, or if, let's say, he only serves up to two years of a second term, and then they remove him from office, he could uh, technically run again, as long as he does not exceed the um, two-term two, uh, 
limit or a toll of 10 years. If he doesn't see that, he can run again. And let's say forbid him from doing so by taking another vote after the impeachment and removing from office. There are no legal consequences of the impeachment process. And that's clear if you read Article 1, Section 3, Clause 7, where it says the president and other civil office holders, if they're impeached, it does not mean then that they are not subject then to the legal process, but not inside of the Congress of the United States. It only has the political uh, part of the male thesis of, of, of the office holders. And that's federal office holders. Now, not all office holders, it's all federal office holders because it does not, um, it does not have anything to do with members of the Senate and members of the House of Representatives who cannot be impeached. People say they want to impeach since the members of Congress are so bad and they are pretty bad. They say we want to impeach the members of the House and impeach some members of the Senate like Maxine Waters in the House and like some of these uh, members in the Senate that are running them up. They can't be impeached because they're not federal office holders they're not federal office holders of the United States. They are civil office holders, but not federal office holders. They are civil office holders, not federal, because they are civil office holders of the states in which they are elected from. That's members of the House and also members of the Senate. So there's another mechanism in the Constitution for their removal, and that's found in Article 1, Section 5, Clause 2. Not Article 1, Section 2, Clause 5, but Article 1, Section 5, Clause 2, which says that each of the Houses of Congress have the power to remove their own members. Okay, that's a nutshell of what we're dealing with. I will watch the uh, process today, and you'll see Robert sitting there, and when you get to the question period, you'll see them passing the questions off to the Chief Justice as the presiding officer, and he will, in fact, read the questions that the members of the Senate will write because they're not even allowed to talk on the floor of the Senate. And that's how it's set up, and that's how it ought to operate without this fusion of bringing other witnesses as they're talking about doing. Okay, we're going to get out of here. Keep watching. You're learning a lot about how the government operates. Keep your eyes on the prize. We're going to win this before it's over. Okay, I want you to follow your dream. Because if you don't follow your dream, you'll never know what's on the other side of the rainbow. <laughs>